I kind of fell in love with it that first visit and decided this is the place for me. I mean, I thought it was like an easy choice. I was born a Hawkeye. It's the only place I ever truly considered with my whole heart. Iowa just has a fantastic program, very storied history. Definitely a choice I do not regret. Walking down the street, I see people that I know every day. There's just something about the environment here that just really pushes you and helps you to achieve any goal possible. Life isn't linear. There's always going to be ups and downs. It's been hard. It's been difficult. You're here uh, more than your home. There are people around me that also struggled in similar ways. Because of that, my friendships and relationships have gone stronger. Mom and Dad, um, I love you. I want to thank you so much. My parents, they moved homes. They worked so hard here. So I just have so much respect for them. Just all the people who've supported me along the way. My wife for picking up our life, her life, her life professionally and personally and moving, you know, a thousand miles from home. Thank you, Dr. Andrew Smelzer, for your constant support. I would like to thank my wife, Laura, for supporting me through this. This is over, but I know I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. I've wanted this for a long time. I can see the light at the end of the tunnel, and I did it.
Good evening, everyone. My name is Brooks Jackson, and I serve as University of Iowa Vice President for Medical Affairs and Dean of the Roy J. and Lucille A. Carver College of Medicine. It is my honor and privilege to welcome you tonight as we celebrate the Carver College of Medicine Class of 2022. This evening's This evening's graduates will receive degrees from two distinct Carver College of Medicine programs, the Master in Medical Education degree and the Doctor of Medicine degree. To all tonight's students, graduates, and on behalf of the Carver College of Medicine, we join your families and friends in celebrating the culmination of your commitment, growth, and academic achievements. This is truly a defining moment on the path to your medical careers. At this time, I would like to acknowledge the faculty in attendance seated here in the front middle section. Thank you all for your work in educating these students in their training to become doctors. We are glad you could join us today in this special occasion. Now, I would like to introduce my colleagues on stage who are part of tonight's commencement ceremony. Beginning at your far right is Dr. Christopher Cooper, Senior Associate Dean for Medical Education and Professor and Vice Chairman of the Department of Urology. <laughs> Dr. Michael Hogsdahl, Clinical Assistant Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology. We look forward to Dr. Hogsdahl's remarks as tonight's commencement speaker. Dr. Jane Lindsay Miller, Director of the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine Office of Consultation and Research in Medical Education and Clinical Associate Professor in the Department of Family Medicine. <laughs> Next, beginning at my far left, I am pleased to int introduce Dr. Jessica Zuzga-Reed, Pediatrician and President-Elect of the Iowa Medical Society, the statewide Professional Association for Iowa's Physicians. Nancy Dunkel of Dyersville, Iowa, who serves on the Board of Regents, State of Iowa. Ms. Dunkel has been a regent since 2017, serving to help govern Iowa's five public educational institutions. And finally, it is with great pleasure that I introduce our University of Iowa President, Barbara Wilson. Dr. Wilson is a communications scholar and an administrative leader in higher education, and she has served as the 22nd president of the university since last summer, uh, opening a new chapter in a tradition of excellence and achievement at this distinguished institution. So please join me in welcoming President Barbara Wilson. Good evening, and welcome to today's commencement ceremony. I am so honored to be a part of this important milestone today, and I offer my heartiest congratulations to all the graduates at this very special moment in your lives. I also want to extend a special greeting and thanks to all the family and friends who are here with us today and to those who couldn't be here but have been an important part of your medical school journey. I know that as medical students, you make enormous sacrifices in many ways to pursue your dreams. And I know you could not pursue those dreams without the support, encouragement, and sacrifices of your loved ones. They are equally part of today's new beginnings, and we are all grateful to them. So let's take a moment and ask our grads to stand up and wave to your family and give them a hearty thank you for all the support they've given you. That's always a little crazy and unscripted, but it's really important. 
Healthcare and the health sciences are central to the University of Iowa's identity, to the intellectual contributions that we make to the world, and to the applied service that we provide to our state and to our nation. I thank you for being part of this great tradition, both in these past few years and on into the future. And as new medical graduates, you are the at the forefront of change. That change is only going to accelerate, both in your professional arenas and in society at large. I know that the intellectual growth and professional skills you have developed here at Iowa will help you ad to adapt to, and I would argue, lead that change. I look forward to seeing how you will contribute to a better future for all of us. Even though we are saying farewell to you today, you, of course, will always be with us. Your work here will always remain a part of our foundation of excellence. Your work in the future will always reflect positively on your University of Iowa education. And we hope that you continue to be a good friend and an advocate for the University of Iowa and that you come back often to visit. In addition, I have one small request. Please wear your Hawkeye gear wherever you go because people will be proud to know you and to recognize you. Once again, congratulations, graduates, good luck, and best wishes for great success in the wonderful years ahead of you. We are very, very proud of you. Well, good evening and welcome to the Carver College of Medicine commencement. Huh. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You know, I thought this class and, and this audience might be a bit different. It's been three years since we had graduation in person, so I, I thought you might be all fired up, but, you know, oh well. No. Nah. <laughs> Wait a minute. First of all, I've got a message to those of you who are just saying, thank God, and praying that I keep it short and sit down. <laughs> Since you're praying, uh, this message came to me from the Almighty, who says, I should not give up on you. Wait, there's more to the message coming in. What's that? I'm also not supposed to say anything publicly that's even remotely religious at a, in their current political environment, especially at a state school's graduation. I wish he would have led with that advice. You know, maybe you don't know, there's no rule that says this event can't be fun. In fact, if it was up to me, I'd make a rule that says it has to be fun. Now, who would have the authority to declare such a rule? <laughs> so, President Wilson, I'm sure Dean Jackson would like to make a recommendation that all those that attend this event must have fun and show their enthusiasm. Would you approve such a recommendation? Great. Now that we've established that, and I've finally seen a, you know, some signs of life and hear from the audience, it sure would be nice to hear from our graduates a little, little bit of uh, excitement as well. You're getting there. <laughs> this is truly a great day. It's a happy day. Granted, it's, it's not as exciting as match day. After all, you sit there and you listen to me read a name, watch someone walk across the stage, and they get a folder that contains their diploma. Surprise. <laughs> but in the spirit of full disclosure, if I was in the audience, I too might be worried that this would be boring. 
To be honest, I would have counted up the number of people graduating and probably multiplied that by 15 seconds a name and trying to determine how long this was gonna last. <laughs> That's just how I roll. Sorry. I'm not sorry. <laughs> and if you're like me, which by now I'm sure everyone in here is grateful they're not, you're mainly just watching for your loved ones to go across the stage and the rest really aren't terribly exciting. Except I guess there's a chance of someone falling off the stage and that, that would add a little bit of excitement, but in my 16 years of doing this, that's never happened. Now granted, in my 16 years of doing this, we never had sort of this obstacle course of potted plants that, that I see up here today, so, so, you know, watch carefully. In a few minutes, I'm gonna tell you why every one of you should be excited about every name that I read. So now that I've gotten your attention and you're wondering what other forbidden subjects I might tread on, religion, check, politics, stay tuned. Let me tell you that this class is truly remarkable. They're a very bright class, as, as you might imagine. And in fact, I wanna ask them a few questions and, and we'll see if, if they get all three of these right. So class, what class has the highest step one mean in our collegiate history? Oh, they do, pretty impressive. And with step one going to pass fail, what class will always retain <laughs> that, that rank? So, yeah. Now we'll see if we can trick them. We'll see if they get cocky with this one or not. What class has the highest step two in collegiate history? Uh, You're right, it's you. <laughs> hey, all right. In fact, they, they blew away the national mean by, by far, uh, greater than any class we've ever had. So again, I, we didn't let them know all of this because we would have had to live with them, but now that they're coming, <laughs> yeah, you, you see where we're going. So there's something more remarkable than, than their intellect and their, their test-taking ability. This class is unique. They began medical school pre-COVID and most of them were just a few months into their clinical training phase, and that's, that's the phase they had been looking forward to since before starting medical school. That's the phase where they actually interact with real patients. And then COVID hit them in the spring of 2020, so they had only been in their clinical rotations for a few months. Suddenly, these students were booted out of the hospital because we did not have masks to protect them or face shields or gowns. By the way, this group is also the group that survived a polar vortex. <laughs> they uh, survived a uh, derecho, which is just a made up name for uh, inland hurricane, which is also something that was made up. Um, <laughs> at any rate, in the spring of 2020, they had to shelter in place and go home and end up watching our newly created medical school lectures and participated in group activities via Zoom for about the next three months. As it turns out, they watched a lot of Netflix, HGTV, the Food Network, <laughs> and who can forget the Tiger King? So. <laughs> this class of students is really like no others because they had a taste of quote unquote the good old days, and then they got thrust into a very different world and it was truly impressive how quickly they adapted. They were very patient with us and their teachers as we tried to navigate uncharted territory and figuring out how we could provide them with a quality medical education that would get them to this day and also prepare them well for their future responsibilities. At the same time, these students began offering suggestions and solutions to help the college, as well as to help the hospital and their patients and in general, our world. So not only did they adapt well, they actually thrived. They remained engaged in both curricular and extracurricular volunteer activities. This group reached out to help. They did what you would want and what you would expect physicians to do. These are good people. They want to do good with their lives and they want to make a positive difference in this world. And that, that is why every one of you should be excited for each new doctor who walks across the stage tonight. 
they're going to help improve our world. Let's ask the class to stand up for a minute and give them another round of applause. So I want to take a few minutes and give these new doctors a bit of final advice. Class, we call this a commencement ceremony. What's commencement mean? Wait, let me rephrase that, okay? Because I know if I ask that question, 90% of you are going to yell out party. And so what's the word commencement mean? Beginning, absolutely. So it may, be, it may seem a bit strange to call your last day of medical school a start or a beginning, but remember at orientation, I told you that you were joining an honorable profession? Now it's official. Now you truly begin or commence being part of this honorable profession. You are so fortunate to be in this career. You get to serve people. You get to help people. You get to make a positive difference in the lives of people and in society. Always remember, this is your calling, and this is your charge, and it's your responsibility. No, how, no matter how much the world or your working environment changes, and it will, at the core of what you do, who you are, is that mission. Help people, serve people, care for people. It's that simple. Help people, serve people, care for people. I just laid a great responsibility on each of you. When you walk across this stage tonight and you receive your cloak, you are joining our sacred and honored profession. And you are publicly and symbolically accepting a cloak of responsibility that is being laid upon you. Now I'm a Spider-Man fan, and you guys remember the movie line, with great power comes great responsibility. great responsibility. So some of you may be thinking, I'm taking on this great responsibility, but what great power do I have? Aside from the obvious gifts of intellect and compassion, you have the powers of medical knowledge and skills which you will use to help and to heal people, as well as to advance the field of medicine. But with your medical degree, you are also granted a special authority. Let me explain. Becoming a medical doctor tonight gives you the power and authority to rise above. Don't get me wrong, you can't fly. You don't have that power. I see some of you are disappointed. But come on, it's a cloak. It's got a hole in it, right? It wouldn't even be a good parachute. So. Let me tell you what I mean by rise above. Your mission to help and to serve your patients is so universally and historically recognized as being pure and true that you're not tethered to the things that distract you from fulfilling your duty and responsibilities. You can remain focused on doing the right thing and rise above the detritus. You've already done this on a massive scale in 2020 when our world was rocked on so many fronts. You recognized your calling and purpose and help despite everything that was going on around you you were able to rise above. I can promise you that other potential distractors will come along, like the pandemic did, that will impact your working environment. These are scary things for many people who don't have your special power and authority. Things like insurance companies and administrators with metrics and new regulations and requirements. Other things like politicians, a.k.a. Dementors. <laughs> I know, I know, it's, it's frightening, and it's a challenging world. But the happy news is, as long as you focus on what's really important, caring and helping patients, you will automatically rise above these things and be able to count your blessings and carry on fighting the good fight. One more thing about your medical degree. It deputizes you to speak the truth as you see it and believe it. Institutional, local, state, national, and world politics be damned. As a physician, your responsibility is to rise above and speak the truth and let the chips fall where they may. 
Now, granted, I'm telling you this as someone who is too left for the right, too right for the left, and too irreverent for the middle. So take, take, take it with a grain of salt, but this is the way I see it. Our society is currently sick, and I think we're at a crossroads. Ironically, there have been so many advances in the last several decades that one road leads to a golden age, whereas the other leads us to the dark ages. We need good people that we trust to speak the truth and lead by example. We, our society, and our world need you to move us in the right direction. This may sound like a heavy load to put on you, but to me, there's no one better than you and your class, and there has never been. Now, I know some of the older people in the audience uh, may be thinking, huh, with this generation, we're doomed. Okay. But to counter this skepticism, which you will hear, I want to leave you with a passage from the book of the Courtier, which was written 500 years ago by Baldassare Castiglione. I think a prop would help with, with uh, this passage. Peter Denson, I see you in the audience. Would you mind standing up? Thanks, Peter. Would, would you mind coming out here just, just so the class can see you? Uh, well, sure, if you'd come up, that'd be great. But uh, No, okay, just, just, just stand there, Peter. That, that's good. So these guys all know who, who Dr. Peter Denson is, but, but you may not. Peter Denson played many roles. Uh, he was a learning community uh, director until Michael Hogsdall took his job. Um, <laughs> he, he was uh, in my position and, until I think I came along and took his job. Um, uh, he was uh, interim chair of uh, internal medicine. He's an infectious disease doctor, made his living by the clap. Um, pr pretty, much, uh, <laughs> pretty much a jack of all trades. But he's also a phenomenal thespian. Uh, and I know this because he's acted like he's been my friend for quite a while. <laughs> so, Peter, t tonight, uh, as, as sort of a living prop, I would ask you to use your, your theatrical skills and uh, just stand there so the class and the audience can look at you. And what I want them to imagine is that you're like an old man from, from a skeptical, you, you know, generation. So, so. And now I'll read you the passage, so you can, you can look at Peter. <laughs> I have many times asked myself, not without wonder, the source of a certain error, which, since it is committed by all the old, Peter, <laughs> without exception, can be believed to be proper and natural to man. Namely, that they all praise the past and blame the present revile our actions and behavior and everything which they themselves did not do when they were young, and affirm, too, that every good custom and way of life, every virtue, and, in short, all things imaginable are always going from bad to worse. And truly, it seems, against all reason, in a cause for astonishment, that maturity of age which, with its long experience and all other respects, usually perfects a man's judgment, in this matter corrupts it so much that he does not realize that if the world were always growing worse, and if fathers were generally better than their sons, we would long since have become so rotten that no further deterioration would be possible. Peter, thank you. Thank you. Uh, pre pre appreciate that. So. Thanks. Go ahead and sit down, Peter. <laughs> yes. Look at that. He's such a consummate actor, he still looks like a, a grumpy old man. So, <laughs> so as a corollary to Castiglione's statement, I'll say it again. There's no one better than you and your class, and there never has been. I'm so proud of each and every one of you, as is this entire audience. We are putting our trust and faith in you. We need you, and we thank you. It's truly been my honor to serve you and help prepare you for the challenging and rewarding career and life that you're about to commence. Thank you.
It's now my pleasure to introduce David Moore III, a fourth year medical student from Iowa Falls, Iowa. David is president of the Carver College of Medicine student government. In his time at the college, he has performed research on the role of nutrition in multiple sclerosis and volunteered both with youth interested in STEM and with children with disabilities at the Iowa Children's Museum. Please help me welcome David Moore. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Cooper, for your kind introduction and a lively speech. I wouldn't expect anything else. Um, but first, I want to say, looking out in the audience, um, I just want to thank you all for being here tonight. Um, whether you're family or friends, I want to thank you on behalf of all the graduates here, as I'm sure they would like to thank you as well. Um, we want to thank you for the support you've provided us, the encouragement you've given us, and just being the soundboards that we needed sometimes throughout medical school. Um, to the staff and faculty members here, um, we want to thank you as well. Thank you for guiding us through hard material and even harder times in some instances. And thank you for teaching us how to be extraordinary physicians. I want to tell you though, I'm sorry I didn't really write this speech for you all. And the podium's kind of turned, so I'm going to come to the side so I can talk to the class, if that's okay for you, for, with you guys. Um, so, what do you guys think? To the graduating class of 2022, we did it, right? <laughs> Can we get some chairs? Yeah, let's go. Um, I can't really believe it either. Um, but it, it's hard to believe that this day is here. And I remember yesterday, us lining up, um, to receive our white coats here. Um, and it just like, even being in the back, just like seeing all your faces just kind of made me reminisce a little bit and I really appreciated that. But then I'm like looking at you now and I'm like, damn guys, we got old. <laughs> we got really old. Um, so regardless, um, even though we may have added a few years, extra years to our complexion, I think I'd say that the ride so far, it's been worth it. Um, the knowledge and experiences that we've gained in the last four years will be instrumental to our success going forward. Although the pandemic changed some things about Carver, I hope you've all appreciated the community that has continued to be a hallmark for CECOM. Uh, the one thing I ask to do as you move on with your lives is to bring that sense of community with you. Lend that helping hand, go above and beyond for your patients, and show kindness to all of those around you. Um, with that being said, keep it short and sweet, um, I don't think there isn't, uh, there isn't a better person that exhibits those values than our commencement speaker tonight, Dr. Michael Hogsdall. Dr. Hogsdall is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and serves as the department's assistant medical clerkship director. He is also one of the faculty directors of the William Bean Learning Community, one of the four, yeah, William Bean Learning Community, <laughs> um, one of the four learning communities here at Carver. Uh, he earned his bachelor's and medical degrees and completed a residency here at Iowa before jo joining the Carver College of Medicine faculty in 2017. And he really has already become a really impactful mentor to a lot of students here. So if you could all please join me in welcoming Dr. Hogsdall. Thank you, David. Thank you for keeping it a kind introduction. <laughs> and thank you, graduates of the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine, class of 2022. It was a really special surprise to receive an email from David uh, several weeks ago informing me that you had unanimously, David, right? You said unanimous, right? <laughs> you had unanimously selected me as your chosen speaker for tonight's ceremony. And no sooner had I accepted the invitation and the sheer weight of this task really began to settle on my heart and my mind. More than once during my preparation in the recent weeks, I've really wanted to ask you, some of you, just what in the heck you were thinking. But since you all checked out after match day, there was no one to be found. <laughs> no, but really, what meaningful message could I possibly deliver to meet the expectations of one who was asked to address graduate graduates at a major academic institution's medical college graduation. 
I ask this because I've only been at this doctoring gig for about nine years. Heck, I've only been on faculty for about five. I only recently got rid of the car I drove in high school, <laughs> and I'm still paying back med school debts. Not just for tuition, mind you, but to Marsha Hopp for some of those back door under the table schedule changes. You guys know. <laughs> so you see, I'm really not that much farther ahead in this game. I'm just a few steps beyond where you are sitting in those seats tonight. And I'll tell you right now that I don't have it all figured out, but I have learned some important lessons along the way, sometimes the hard way. So tonight, I have just a couple of thoughts to share, and I'm going to be real with you all about what lies ahead. Just like if you had dropped by one of my offices, or if I pulled you aside on the clinical rotation, and don't think for a minute that we're going to sit down with some of that ridiculous bread garden coffee. <laughs> we're going to take one more nice long walk across the UIHC campus for some Java House while we chat. And don't worry, we've got lots of time. You know why? Because my residents are doing all the hard work. <laughs> So here we go, settle in, and let me offer you just a few short thoughts on how to approach your new role as doctors and your next phase of training. Good, ordinary doctors. As my great-grandmother reached her 90s, she understood that she would not live long enough to see each of her great-grandchildren grow up. But she liked to imagine what we might each become, and she liked to bring it up for discussion almost every time we gathered. Oh, Michael, she would say, practically singing it to a tune that she recalled from her country school days. And once she started down this conversation path, really more like a prose of foreshadowing her great-grandchildren's futures, while the rest of us would just grin at each other, listen, and play along. We knew almost every word because she'd been reciting it for years. My career forecast came after my older cousin Peter. Peter will be a preacher, she'd say. And oh, Michael, Michael is going to be a doctor, isn't he? I wonder what kind of doctor he'll be. The good, ordinary type, I hope. A good, ordinary doctor. Now, I was only in middle school when she began to regularly recommend that I become a good, ordinary doctor. And today, I'm a little disappointed to admit that while I think of her often, I haven't reflected on her theme of a good, ordinary doctor for quite some time. What did she really mean by this? Does the ideal even apply to healthcare today? And would she be proud of my doctoring? So let's think a little bit about what my great-grandmother's experiences with healthcare may have been like. To begin, you should know that she was born in the same year the Wright brothers first set flight, 1903, and she grew up in very rural Minnesota. Her birth was probably about as natural as it gets. She was probably born at home, and maybe the delivery was attended by a physician. She lived in an antibiotic-free world until she turned 25 in 1928 as penicillin was accidentally discovered. She and my grandpa would have three daughters, all of which were also likely to have been home births. There's no doubt that doctoring was much different back then, especially in rural America. We have all heard of the doctors who made house calls, right? These physicians were always on the job and taking calls, and they didn't enjoy the ease of access to the laboratory studies imaging media, consultants, and medications that we utilize today with such facility. Nope, these doctors relied most heavily on their education, physical exam skills aided by a bag of tools, and the patient in front of them. And over time, this contributed to a growing foundation of experiences that they could catalog in mental files to inform their future clinical reasoning. So let's pause just a second before we dig further into this theme. And let me ask you at this point in the story, now that you've completed tours through almost every current field of medicine and learned the latest and greatest in medical science and technology, who wants to sign up for the good, ordinary residency program of the 1900s? Any takers? Those of us sitting up here and out there actually hope that you all will. We adamantly believe that you all can, or we wouldn't have helped you get to the seat you are in tonight. You see, the farther I get in this career, the more I think I have a better idea of what my grandmother meant when she encouraged me, or rather as she encourages us, to be good, ordinary doctors. She shared many stories about the local doctor helping her family or a nearby neighbor, and while I've forgotten the details about who was ill and what the diagnosis was, 
I distinctly remember that she always spoke fondly of the physician, holding them in high esteem. Now, I'd like to suggest that two factors contributed to this heroic reputation. The obvious one is the health quality and outcomes of the patients they attended, often in the patient's own home. And the other factor that we can't forget could be described as their bedside manner. It's how they might have interacted, communicated, counseled, celebrated, and even grieved with their patients as just another good, ordinary neighbor. It's how they responded to a phone call in the middle of the night for something that was probably nothing, but could have been something. Being a good, ordinary doctor wasn't about existing in a scientifically primitive, early 20th century healthcare system. It wasn't even necessarily about being available 24-7 and making house calls throughout the countryside. I think the good, ordinary doctoring that my grandmother spoke of was about character. It's a character that complements your medical knowledge and technical skills, character that strives to stay loyal and true to the virtues of medical practice that have carried the patient-provider relationship through the centuries. It's the steadfast ethics, morals, and humanism that have sustained the field through recurring societal shifts and changes, not at all unlike those which we are experiencing right now. We can get another more modern perspective on the esteemed character we might expect of a good ordinary doctor from New York Times columnist David Brooks in his book, The Road to Character. Now this might sound familiar because I've shared it with many of you before. Recall that in the passage that I like to share, Brooks is reflecting on two competing categories of virtues that contribute to character, the resume virtues and the eulogy virtues. He explains that, quote, the resume virtues are the ones you list on your resume, the skills that you bring to the job market and that contribute to your external success. The eulogy virtues are deeper. They're the virtues that get talked about at your funeral, the ones that exist at the core of your being, whether you are kind, brave, honest, faithful, and what kind of relationships you formed. To get to this point in your professional career, you have needed to focus on developing your resume virtues. And while what lies ahead in residency and beyond will certainly test your medical knowledge and technical skill, some of your greatest and possibly the most persistent challenges will test the character founded upon your eulogy virtues as good, ordinary doctors. Your objective when you get to residency should be to advance your specialty-specific skills and knowledge while simultaneously shaping the character you want to be remembered for. My warning is that if you are not intentional, the pressure and intensity of your training may lead you to forsake the eulogy virtues in a singular pursuit of more resume virtues. Your opportunities to practice good, ordinary doctoring will start on day one. It might present as a fairly simple choice in the beginning. For example, in your new role as an intern, you might order the wrong diagnostic test, or you might just not have any idea what a constellation of findings mean as you present them on rounds. Or maybe in your haste to understand a complex care plan, you incorrectly counsel a patient on what their next steps will be. It's uncomfortable to be wrong or to not know something, but it is okay. Adjust your clinical reasoning and spend some time discussing the miscommunication with your patient and your team. As you progress, things will get more complex and you will be busier. Your decision on what virtues to demonstrate in certain situations will have to come quicker. You might get a call from the floor nurse about a patient that would like you to just explain their condition one more time so they can feel more reassured before discharge. Or perhaps that nurse or your intern even wake you during your overnight call with concerns about a patient that doesn't seem quite right. It's probably nothing, you think, but it could be something. It could be a consult request from another specialty that just seems silly to you. Or maybe it's a patient who just doesn't believe COVID-19 is real or that vaccines are safe. And it will begin, oops, sorry. And this while the death of a recent patient is still all too fresh. Your reaction in these scenarios will quickly become instinctual. 
and it will begin to define your character as a member of the broader healthcare team. Will you be too busy and not have time, or will you be approachable and patient? Finally, it is inevitable that at some point in your training, you will encounter some of the worst pathology respective to your specialty. You are now the chief, the frontline leader, second only to a fellow or your attending, and it might feel like you are losing control of a situation, but in many cases, control of the pathology was a wishful illusion. This is the 20-year-old with advanced ovarian cancer who's running out of time. She was diagnosed when you were a junior resident, and now it's time to have a goals of care discussion. Or the other 20-year-old, already a mother of two, from your antepartum service with suspected placenta accreta. She starts to hemorrhage overnight, prompting you to activate the plan that your team has really refined over the last few years for this exact reason. You perform the cesarean delivery, baby gets handed safely to the NICU, but the bleeding in the pelvis will not abate. Not for you, not for your fellow or your attendings, not for anesthesia or the vascular team. The pathology was greater than our collective efforts could overcome and there's a family waiting for an update. So these aren't familiar experiences to you yet, but they are to me. They are just a few of the defining moments I can reflect on which called upon me to be intentional in my development of character, to choose to practice the eulogy virtues and to be there for patients, their families, and team members during difficult or just inconvenient times as a good ordinary doctor. In the beginning, I didn't always recognize the simple opportunities to build good, ordinary habits, but I had great role models in my residency class, my seniors, fellows, and faculty. Wherever you are going, you will also have examples to learn from. Model the best providers that you work with and learn lessons from the less ideal examples that you encounter. As you build your character, remember that you are also a model for the learners under you. There you have it. Those are my thoughts on what my, I think my grandmother truly meant when she encouraged me to be a good, ordinary doctor. Again, it wasn't about the more simplistic period she grew up in. It was reference to the value of loyalty to the field of medicine, our patients, our team members, and ourselves. It is combining medical knowledge and technical skills in our respective specialties with a strong complement of character. Character that Dr. Cooper said is universal to the field and founded in Brooks' theme of eulogy virtues that are kindness, honesty, bravery, faithfulness, and quality of relationships. During the good times, and you will have far more good times than hard times, practicing the good character will come more naturally. After all, an altruistic core brought us all here. But beware of the challenging times, the difficult and dissonant times, when we feel the tension between resume and eulogy virtues. These are the times that matter most to your growth, and these will be the experiences that Brooks says will put iron in your core and help to cultivate a wise heart. It turns out that becoming a good ordinary doctor is not simple at all. It takes a lifetime of extraordinary practice and appreciation for all of those around you. Your greatest training adventure is just weeks away, and you are all ready. I want to thank you one more time for the honor and opportunity to celebrate with you tonight. All of us here wish you the best. Those of us from the college, thank you for your diligent efforts of heart and mind over the past several years, and we hope you know we will always be rooting for you. Thank you. Alrighty. Thank you, Dr. Hodgdahl, for your remarks. Um, next time you give a speech, we got you a clock. Um, so, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah. Just saying. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Hogstall. It's a distinct honor to present to everyone uh, three of this year's graduates of the Master in Medical Education program. 
The MME students receiving their degrees tonight are all healthcare providers who, in addition to their clinical responsibilities, spent the last two to three years uh, mastering their um, acumen as medical educators. They bring the total number of graduates in our program to more than 60, representing over 15 different departments or programs in the Carver College of Medicine. The MME program is one of the college's marks of distinction, dedicated to developing a community of academic medical faculty with formal training and education, committed to creating and sustaining a culture of educational excellence. This community of exemplary educators serves not only the Carver College of Medicine, but also UI Healthcare, the University of Iowa, and the medical education community at large. Lifelong learning through reflection is essential for physicians in clinical practice, as well as the educators who teach them. Fostering that lifelong learning is at the heart of the MME program and our educational mission. So congratulations to all of tonight's graduates. Will the candidates for the Master in Medical Education please stand? President Wilson, these candidates, having completed all of the requirements for the degree of Master in Medical Education, are recommended to you by the faculty of the Carver College of Medicine for the conferring of this degree. On the recommendation of the faculty of the Carver College of Medicine and by the authority vested in me by the Board of Regents, State of Iowa, I confer on you the Master in Medical Education degree as qualified and designated. Will the candidates please come forward to receive their diplomas? Natasha Madhu Reynolds. Wanda Lynn Pfeiffer. <laughs> Catherine Robb. So will the candidates for the Doctor of Medicine degree please stand? <laughs> President Wilson, these candidates having completed all the requirements for the degree of Doctor of Medicine are recommended to you by the faculty of the Carver College of Medicine for the conferring of this degree. On the recommendation of the faculty of the Carver College of Medicine and by the authority vested in me by the Board of Regents, State of Iowa, I confer on each of you the degree of Doctor of Medicine as qualified and designated. Will the Doctor of Medicine graduates please be seated. Dean Jackson, 
On behalf of the faculty and administration of the Carver College of Medicine, I present to you these graduates who have just been awarded the degree Doctor of Medicine. They will now be presented with their doctoral hoods and diplomas. The shell of the hood matches the black material of the gown and is lined with the old gold color of the University of Iowa. The velvet border of the hood is indicative of medicine, which is traditionally represented by the color green. Joining me in the presentation of hoods will be our student affairs associate and assistant deans, Drs. Asprey, Shibley Rahal, and Choi. Graduates, will you please come forward to receive your hoods and diplomas. Dr. Soham Ali. Dr. Samiksha Anira. Dr. Andrea Artover. Dr. Jameson Ash. Dr. Madison Bagnall. Dr. Oma Balakrishnan. Dr. Emma Barr. Dr. Brandon Bates. Dr. Lisa Bell. Dr. Eric Bertroche. <laughs> Dr. Hannah Botkin. <laughs> Dr. Corby Berkey. Dr. Nicholas Caldwell. <laughs> Dr. Nathan Cow. <laughs> Dr. Emily Capper. Dr. Claire Castaneda. Dr. Olivia Chase. Dr. Edison Chin. Dr. Lauren Coffey. <laughs> Dr. Cyrus Cola. Well Dr. Gabriel Conley. Do you want your 
her middle name? Dr. Madeline Cusimano. <laughs> Dr. Rachel Dahl. <laughs> Dr. Erica Dorf. Dr. Alexandra Eckberg. <laughs> Dr. Haley Egan. <laughs> Dr. Jacob Elam. Dr. Lucy Evans. <laughs> Dr. Allison Philman. <laughs> Dr. Samantha Fitzgerald. Dr. Joelle Friesen. <laughs> Dr. Abby Fife. <laughs> Dr. Julia Gales. Dr. Jaquiel Givens. <laughs> Dr. Jennifer Good. <laughs> Dr. Pavani Gorapati. Dr. Heather Green. <laughs> Dr. Grinton Greif. <laughs> Dr. Emma Grayman. Raymond. <laughs> Emma, one second. Let me get the last name right. <laughs> Dr. Emma Griman. <laughs> Dr. Sarah Gross. Dr. Kyle Grover. <laughs> Dr. Jacob Gilton. <laughs> Dr. Haley Hansen. Dr. Hunter Hayes. <laughs> Dr. Devin Headland. Well 
Dr. Erica Henderson. Dr. Grant Henning. Dr. John Henrich. Dr. James Hickman. Dr. Sonny Wong. Dr. Tyler Hughes. Dr. Roberto Infante Rosado. Dr. Brooke Jennings. Dr. Nicole Johnston. Dr. Zara Khan. Dr. Sawyer Kiefer. <clears throat> Dr. Kyle Kinder. <clears throat> Dr. Taryn Kinghorn. Dr. Mitchell Kinkor. Dr. Allison Klimesh. Dr. Monica Canuck. Dr. Brandon Koch. <laughs> Dr. Tiname Kone. <laughs> Dr. Hope Kramer. Dr. Jared Larson. Dr. Tyler Larson. Dr. Ryan Lavering. Dr. Stephen Leary. Dr. Alice Lee. Dr. Nicholas Lind. Dr. William Lorenzen. Woo! 
Dr. Michael Lung. Dr. Robert Mangas. Dr. Katherine Marsden. Dr. Timothy Maxwell. Dr. Rose McLaughlin. Dr. Kelsey McCullough. Dr. Leanna Meffert. Dr. Alex Meyer. Dr. Matthew Meyer. Dr. Abigail Moore. Dr. David Moore III. Dr. Gabriella Morgan. Dr. Jenna Mullins. Dr. Bethany Meiskins. Dr. Theodora Ordog. Dr. Abioi Oshodi. Dr. Carlos Asorno Cruz. <laughs> Dr. Adokale Atanwa. Dr. Thomas Pack. Dr. Samuel Palmer. Dr. Sivani Parsa. Dr. Brian Paul. Dr. Hunter Fluhop. Dr. Nicole Platy. Dr. Danielle Pohl. Congratulations. Why are we doing this? You guys are changing it up on me. <laughs> Dr. Jennifer Ponsolet.
I like going to the old world. So. Dr. Francesca Prospero. <laughs> Dr. Ashley Radig. <laughs> Dr. Benjamin Reisner. Dr. Leah Ryerson Baumler. Dr. Annie Rimple. Thank you for going the right way. Congratulations. Dr. Valerie Rincor. Dr. Alex Ryer. Dr. Jose Rios. Dr. Jasmine Roguer. Dr. Edvin Rosick. <laughs> Dr. Natalie Ross. <laughs> Dr. Jeremy Sanchez. Dr. Vail Archana Santana. Dr. Deepan Sarkar. Dr. Christopher Schonbacher. Dr. Morgan Schill. Thank you. Dr. Anthony Schneider. Dr. Eric Schneiders. Dr. Joshua Schulte. Dr. Laura Sazinski. Dr. Timothy Savchek. Dr. Omar Shaban. <laughs> Dr. Mahek Shahid. <laughs> Dr. Ashton Sherman. Dr. Christopher Sidwell. Dr. Risham Singh.
Dr. Laurel Smines. Dr. Emily Salzrud. Dr. Elena Stutt. Dr. Daniel Syed. Dr. Art Tanopakorn. Dr. Marcus Torrell. Dr. Calvin Tran. Dr. Charlene Tran. Dr. Emily Trudeau. <clears throat> Dr. Zachary Tully. Dr. Gabriel Velez. Dr. Megan Vree. Dr. Nadia Wahaba. Oh, you went behind me? Dr. Mackenzie Walhoff. Dr. Ben Walker. Dr. Yixi Wong. Dr. Cassie Wasink. Dr. Kristen Weeks. Dr. Sanjeeva Weerasinghe. Dr. Grace Welp. <laughs> Dr. Sean Westendorf. <laughs> Dr. Amy Willock. Dr. Anna White. Dr. Kian Zari.
I would now like to address the doctors of medicine as you have come upon a decisive moment in your development as a physician. You are about to recite the physician's oath, which is based on the oath of Hippocrates. While you took a very similar oath at the Carver College of Medicine white coat ceremony a few years ago at the start of your medical education, and as you have honored that promise, the next few moments will set you apart from your medical school career. This oath is a symbol of your commitment to the healing arts and as an acknowledgement of your solemn duty to perform the very best of your ability. I ask you to think very seriously about what the oath means, especially the importance it signifies to those you will serve in your role as a healthcare provider. As you commit to each paragraph, concentrate on the meaning of your vow and how you must see it through. Thus acknowledging the magnitude of this ceremony, I now ask the Doctor of Medicine graduates to please rise and turn to page nine of your program. I'd also like to invite Lisa Bell, our student recipient of the 2022 Leonard Tao Humanism in Medicine Award to come forward to lead the graduates in reciting the physician's oath. I do solemnly swear by that which I hold most sacred that as I enter the profession of medicine, my primary responsibility will always be toward my patients. I will regard my patients always as fellow human beings and will do everything possible to preserve their dignity. I will try to treat and prevent disease, maintain health, and aid my patients in realizing their life's potential so far as is possible with the skills of medical science. I will seek to inform my patients fully about their illnesses, and I will always remember that the final decision regarding their own life rests with them. I will never knowingly do a disservice and I will do everything possible to preserve the privacy of my patients. I will perform my professional role to the best of my ability, but I will never hesitate to call upon the assistance of other physicians or health professionals when indicated. I will try always to cooperate with my fellow professionals and will seek actively to improve my profession and the service it delivers. I will remember that I am a participating member in a larger community, and as a trusted servant of that community, I share responsibility for the planning of social policy toward constructive goals. I pledge to continue to educate myself throughout my career and continually to engage in a critical re-examination of myself as a rational, emotional, and spiritual human being. Please be seated. Class of 2022, congratulations. Our state and nation are fortunate to receive such bright, talented, and compassionate physicians, researchers, educators, and healthcare providers. I would like to take this moment to acknowledge some other very important people here with us. In addition to celebrating your accomplishments, commencements are also a time for us to express gratitude and appreciation to the parents, spouses, family members, and friends of tonight's graduates. You have helped make this journey possible with your love, support, and encouragement. We recognize this as a celebration for you as well. I would also like to recognize and extend my appreciation to our outstanding faculty members, many of whom are here tonight to celebrate our new graduates. Thank you for your dedication and support as you have helped guide, nurture, and mentor this outstanding class of graduates. Following this ceremony, my colleagues and I will be in the lobby where we look forward to congratulating you Personally, I wish each of you the very best as you embark on your future endeavors. If your career plans take you away from Iowa, please know you are always welcome and encouraged to come see us when you are back in town. And if you are staying here, 
We are very glad to have you. To formally conclude, I ask the graduates to please stand and I ask the audience to join me in concluding these proceedings by saluting you with one more round of applause. <laughs>